Tamna Svina Sadani Rasta Kuhukam Satyam Param Dimahi O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O all-pervading personality of Godhead. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes <coughs> manifested by the reaction of three modes of nature appear factual although they are unreal. I therefore re meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations in the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Pujita Kaitra Vutra Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam tapa trayon mulanam. Shivadam tapa trayon mulanam. mahamuni krite. Kim va parer ishwaraha. Sadyo hridi avuridya te cha. Kriti bihi susu sabis takshana. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam, compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity, is sufficient in itself for self-realization. Self what is the need, no, I'm sorry, is sufficient in itself for God-realization? What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nikama kalpatarur galitam falam. Sukumakad amrita dravya samyutam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Muhur aho raska buvi bhavukaha. O expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to read Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Even though its nectarine juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Vidyan Takstu Bhadrani Vidunati Suhit Sutam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures 
or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna who is dwelling within everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nastapresu Bhadvesu Nityamba Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki In this way a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. Naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotee. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lust and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso Bhagavad bhakti yogataha Bhagavad tattva vijjana Mukta sangha sijayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate becomes uh, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. Becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Krishna Evatmanishwari. Thus, Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. Hard knot of material affection. And enables one to come at once to the stage of a Samsayam Samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth. Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Kuntaraja Ki Jai. Canto 1, Chapter 13, Verse Number 49. Yoyam Adya Maharaja. Yoyam Adya Maharaja. Bhagavan Bhuta Bhavana. Bhagavan Bhuta Bhavana. Kala Rupo. Vaitirno, I'm still Kala Rupo, Vartirno Syam, Kala Rupo, Vartirno Syam, Abhavaya Suradvisam. That Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna, in the guise of all devouring time, Kala Rupa, has now descended on earth to eliminate the envious from the world. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. There are two classes of human being, namely the envious and the obedient. Since the Lord is one and the Father of all living beings, the envious living beings are also His sons, but they are known as the Asuras. But the living beings who are obedient to the Supreme Father are called devatas or demigods because they are not contaminated by the material conception of life. Not only are the Asuras envious of the Lord in even denying the existence of the Lord, but they are also envious of all other living beings. The predominance of Asuras in the world 
is occasionally rectified by the Lord when he eliminates them from the world and establishes a rule of devatas like the Pandavas. His designation as Kala in disguise is significant. He is not at all dangerous, but he is the transcendental form of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. For the devotees, his factual form is disclosed, and for the non-devotees, he appears like Kala Rupa, which is causal form. This causal form of the Lord is not at all pleasing to the Asuras, and therefore they think of the Lord as formless in order to feel secure that they will not be vanquished by the Lord. Shimad Bhagavatam Grantaraja Ki Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai so it says, this causal form of the Lord is not at all pleasing to the Asuras, and therefore they think of the Lord as formless in order to feel secure that they will not be vanquished by the Lord. So this is very interesting. First of all, what does it mean, this causal form? Well, time is the cause of destruction in the material world, and time in the spiritual world, world supports all the spiritual activities of the devotees. In the material world, time is understood by its passage. And in the spiritual world, time is understood by its non-passage. In other words, things just keep getting better and better and not diminished in the spiritual world. Whereas in the material world, things just get worse and worse and uh, everything is eventually destroyed. So, the devotees have the perception of time as supporting their spiritual activities. And the non-devotees have the perception of time as destroying their so-called happiness and material assets and so forth. So in order not to be afraid of the causal activity of time, they imagine that the Lord is formless and not a person. It's a very interesting how Prabhupada has explained this. Because if God is a person and he's all-powerful, then they must surrender. So in order not to surrender, they imagine that he's as formless, he's not a person, just some force. And, and because the demons have learned to a certain measure how to control the force of electromagnetism and work a little bit with the force of gravity. So they think, oh, well, this is just a force and we can control it and we can make it better. And actually, it's not true. Yeah, how can you make it better? Well, they make cell phones and so many people are, are happy about the cell phones, but yet the cell phones cause cancer putting it to your ear all the time, eventually it's, it, with all that electromagnetism can affect the brain. And uh, airplanes, yeah, well, airplanes are basically a tin box in which everyone's breathing each other's bre uh, 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 ex exhaled um, breath. And no, no new air is going into the airplane, it's just being recycled over and over again. That's why so many people get sick when they take airplanes. And then cars, well, the cars are getting into accidents all the time, especially in India, people die all the time of car accidents. So we see with every new invention, there are new miseries that come with them. In fact, one new invention, two or three new miseries. So, uh, yeah, like for example, it's, one lady was telling me that uh, she has a relative in India and who has three sons and her middle son was always on the cell phone. So one day she got really angry and took the cell phone away from him. And he got really angry, went into his room and committed suicide. Ah, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. <coughs> So, uh, we see that there's tragedy even in good families. Why? Because 
First of all, who gave him the cell phone? Let's ask that question. Who gave him the cell phone? The parents gave him the cell phone. They thought they were doing him a favor. And then he misuses it in their estimation. And they get angry and they take it away from him. And he gets angry and he commits suicide. So every time there's one new invention, there are a whole bunch of corollary negative effects of that invention. It's like you have a cell phone or you have a computer. All of a sudden the husband realizes the wife is uh, communicating with other men on the cell phone, or the husband is communicating with other women on the cell phone or the, or the computer. So this uh, over-dependence uh, over on gadgets is actually a dangerous thing. So for so many years, people live without these gadgets. However, we see that 5,000 years ago, people like Sanjaya didn't need the gadget to communicate and understand what's going on far away. They had this internal system of uh, something like a electromagnetic waves, but it's a, a different system. And so Sanjaya could understand what was happening in real time in Kurukshetra, although it's hundreds of miles away from Delhi or Hastinapur. So he was explaining in real time the discussion between Krishna and uh, Arjuna. And Prabhupada talks about that. It's very, it's a, it's an internal system that pure devotees can connect to. It's called inst instead of the uh, Yahoo or Google, it's called the Krishna Net, right? And the Krishna Network. So, if we become purified, we can connect to the Krishna Network and see in real time what's going on in the spiritual world, or see in real time what's happening anywhere. So, uh, here we see, he's, Prabhupada says, there's two classes of people. There's the asuras and the devotees. The asuras are envious. And therefore, uh, they become enemies of the Lord. Just like Kamsa, he was Krishna conscious. Sisapala was also Krishna conscious. Ravana was also Krishna conscious, but negatively Krishna conscious, always thinking about how to kill Krishna, always envious of Krishna. So that Krishna consciousness, that's called virupa. Uh, it's uh, wanting to kill Krishna. But the devotees are Krishna conscious, and their Krishna consciousness is called swarupa, or satchitananda rupa. They are not envious of the Lord, they're obedient to the Lord. So there's the envious and the obedient. The envious want to kill Krishna and the obedient want to serve Krishna. So the obedient uh, devotees, they have Krishna's protection. And the envious people, they have Krishna's destruction. So you want perfection uh, or, or protection or you want destruction. You have to make that decision in your life or all of us have to make that decision. If we choose Krishna, that means we want to hear Srimad Bhagavatam every day and Bhagavad Gita every day. And if we are envious of Krishna, we don't want to hear Bhagavatam every day and we don't want to hear Bhagavad Gita every day. We want to hear the news, we want to hear politics, we want to hear this thing, that thing, all nonsense stuff that just contaminates the mind and makes us more and more victims of Kala Rupa, the time element that destroys things. Okay, so then, but the living entities who are obedient to the Supreme Father are called devatas or demigods because they are not contaminated by the material conception of life. Now, what is this material conception of life? It's a very interesting point. And Material conception of life, I explain it, of course, explained by Prabhupada, but uh, in this little booklet that I wrote once, Metaphysical Questions of Life. And where is it? Let 
Material conception of life is obviously <clears throat> the goal is sense gratification. Okay. Point one. And then material conception of life means forgetfulness of Krishna. And everything that follows is ignorance. Prabhupada says uh, when a person becomes Krishna conscious, he realizes that the material world is full of illusory and false things. Gradually, he becomes detached from affection for society, friendship, and love, which often leads to deception and frustration. In material life, one is subject to the laws of karma, and one cannot avoid its reactions. The modern civilization is attempting to avoid the miseries of life like birth, old age, disease, and death by advancement of material scientific knowledge. These attempts only entrench people more into the material conception of life with the false hope of achieving material peace, happiness, and love. Rather, they experience more complicated life situations and miseries and only have temporary pleasures which are more lust than real love. So, what, what is the material conception of life? Number one, attachment to the objects of sense gratification. Number two, one is preoccupied by many material desires. When one is frustrated, he develops hatred and envy. Three, one seeks happiness outside of himself by enticing victims for his sense gratification. He seeks the company of other persons suffering from the same illusions. He dislikes the feeling of loneliness and seclusion as long as he feels successful in materialistic society. Four, he has a tendency to overindulge in eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Five, he loses control over the activities of the senses and the mind. Six, due to identifying oneself with the temporary body rather than the eternal soul within the body, he develops the false ego that he is the body and identifies himself with the temporary designations of family, race, ethnicity, nationalism, etc. Seven, he tries to prolong his existence in the temporary body by material strategies of diet, bodybuilding, supplements, plastic surgery, and other medical procedures. Okay, so those are seven points, and there are others, but uh, you get the idea that this material conception of life is a dangerous thing. Eight, because of his misconceptions, he develops the false ego and becomes falsely proud of his temporary material achievements. Nine, he is never satisfied, and whenever he is frustrated in achieving his material goals, he becomes angry and resentful and always blames others for his failures. Ten, when he cannot get as much sense gratification as he wants, he becomes angry and delusional in his behavior. 11. He over-endeavors to acquire material sense objects and always seeks to be praised for his material possessions and achievements. 12. He becomes completely entangled and attached excessively to material things and in his total state of bewilderment loses all interest in spiritual knowledge and God-related pursuits. 13. His mind then is overwhelmed by material considerations and becomes constantly anxious and fearful as he gets older, sick, and approaches death. Okay, there are three stages of the material conception of life. One, negligence of spiritual life because of too much attachment to material pleasure, pleasures. Two, fear of an eternal spiritual personal identity that gives rise to the mistaken concept that one may merge into the homogeneous oneness of the impersonal light called the Brahma Jyoti. Three, or the conception of void after death that comes from frustration in life from which one develops disbelief in everything, being angry at all sorts of spiritual speculation out of hopelessness. One may adopt different forms of intoxication and any hallucinations one may experience are ex accepted as spiritual visions. 
Another aspect of accepting the material conception of life is the perverted material understanding one develops of the different species of life due to ignorance of the soul. One sees only the different types of bodies of living beings, dog, cat, man, elephant, insect, fish, bird, etc. The reality is that the individual soul in each species of life has nothing to do with the incidental bodies that entrap him. One receives a material body according to the different unfulfilled desires of the previous life and karma and good and bad reactions of activities. So, this is the material conception of life. It's horrible. But yet, this is what people are, are living with and they think that it is life. It says, uh, but the demigods or saintly persons who are obedient to the Lord, they are not contaminated by the material conception of life. And Prabhupada says, not only are the Asuras envious of, of the Lord in even denying the existence of the Lord, but they are also envious of all other living beings. Not only that, they become envious of themselves. Since we are part and parcel of Krishna, if you become envious of Krishna, you will be envious of yourself. This is explained in the 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, verse number 18, where it says, A demoniac person, being always against God's supremacy, does not like to believe in the scriptures. He is envious of both the scriptures and the existence of the Supreme Personality Godhead. This is caused by his so-called prestige and his accumulation of wealth and strength. He does not know that the present life is a preparation for the next life. Not knowing this, he is actually envious of his own self as well as of other people, uh, as well as of others. He commits violence on other bodies and on his own. So these, these are the symptoms of people who have this overwhelming material conception of life and they become envious of Krishna and then they become envious of themselves and the proof that one is envious of themselves, they refuse to be Krishna conscious no matter how much people try and help them. They reject it. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other, any questions or comments? A lot of points, yes. The, the, the key word is obedient. As bad as they may act, mm -hmm. when uh, there's trouble, they run to Lord Vishnu and ask for help. And eventually, even though they're attached to sense gratification, they will listen to the Lord's advice. That's a demigod. Whereas the Asuras, no matter how much they they try to be sent uh, to be uh, equal or greater than Krishna, they fail, but they never take good advice. They're not obedient. They're recalc recalcitrant. They're they're rebellious all the time. They refuse, just like Ravana. Many times he was advised by his wife, by Marichi, by his brother, Vibhishan, by uh, so many, uh, Mandodari, of course, and, and others. Even the Kumbhakarna tried a little bit to convince a little bit, right? But when he saw how angry his brother was getting, he, he you know, immediately backed off. <laughs> so there were many occasions for him to do the right thing and stop the whole uh, you know, process of self-destruction, but he refused categorically. You know, say so. That's the difference between a demigod and a demon. Demigods make mistakes. Some sometimes their mistakes are as bad as the demons, but they will in the in the final issue 
take, be obedient and take the advice of uh, pure devotees or the Lord himself. Whereas the demons, no. No way. Jose. They won't accept. They won't be obedient. So the key word is obedient. Yes. 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 Ah, uh, no. Kal Arjuna wanted to see it for future generations, not for himself. He wasn't really interested in it. But he, and, and the proof is that after seeing it, he, he begged the Lord, please, you know, stop this. I don't want to see it anymore. And then, so the Lord then... Uh, showed him his form as Narayana, and he said, well, you know, it's, this is okay, but I want to see your, that form that it was on the chariot with me. You know, yeah. Manasam, uh, uh, what is it? He's, he calls it his beautiful form. Manasam Rupam. Uh, no, that's not the exact term. One second, I'll find it. So, that proves that Arjuna was more interested in Krishna's original form than any of these other things that he was seeing. Yeah, so it's called the uh, Somya Vapu, your beautiful form. So uh, Krishna, having spoken thus to Arjuna, displayed his real forearm form and at last showed his two-arm form, thus encouraging the fearful Arjuna. Arjuna, in purport, Prabhupada said, Krishna knew that Arjuna was not interested in seeing a four-handed form, but since Arjuna asked to see this four-handed form, Krishna also showed him this form again and then showed himself in his two-handed form. The word Somyavapu is very significant. Somyavapu is a very beautiful form. It is known as the most beautiful form. When he, meaning Krishna, was present, everyone was attracted simply by Krishna's form, and because Krishna is the director of the universe, he just banished the fear of Arjuna, his devotee, and showed him again his beautiful form of Krishna. In the Brahma Samhita 538, it is stated, Premanjana Churita Bhakti Vilochanena. Only a person who has eyes, only a person whose eyes are smeared with the ointment of love can see the beautiful form of Sri Krishna. So that's... Uh, 11th chapter, 50th verse. What is that ointment of love? It's the tears you shed when thinking of Krishna with love. It, that melts the cataract of the eye. And you can see the beautiful form of the Lord. Yeah. No, in the spiritual world, there's the eternal present. And people notice that time is going by, but things are just getting better. They're not getting worse. So they notice time by its non-passage. It's supporting their loving activities with the Lord. And they notice that. You know. Whereas here we notice as time goes by, things get worse. You know, we get old, we get sick. And so many things happen. Basically, the way we, uh, we notice about the time because of deterioration. Yes. As, as we've seen at this, at this time. Yeah, but time for devotees, uh, we notice that things get better. Like, look, look, Prabhupada was here, right? It started out really humbly, like, nothing, right? And it just kept getting better and better. I mean, even though along the way there were problems, but the problems were overcome and things just got better and better. And book distribution, opening temples, numbers of devotees, so, so forth. Yeah. So this is, uh, in other words, if you want to be successful in life, just become Krishna conscious and hear Bhagavatam every day. 
and follow the rules and regulations, and you will be successful. Prabhupada says it over and over again in many different places. So it depends how much we like ourselves. If we hate ourselves, then we won't do this. And if we like ourselves, we'll do it. Haribo. Ogo is to Prabhupada ki jai. It means that although a person has a chance to be Krishna conscious, they don't take it. That's that's the proof that they're envious of themselves. Although they may be initiated, they don't follow the, all the rules. That means they're envious of themselves. How do you become envious of yourself? You become... Well, you develop this material conception. And the first point of the material conception is that you're convinced that your happiness is through sense gratification. And nothing's, nothing, not, not initiation, nothing is going to change that. So that's a very dangerous position to be in. In other words, attachment to objects of sense gratification. Point number one of the material conception of life. As long as we remain, we remain attached to the objects of sense gratification, we don't, know, we don't really make any spiritual advancement, although we may be trying in some ways, but as long as that attachment is there, it, it undermines all our uh, activities. And we don't let go of it. That means you're envious of yourself. Well, there's two kinds of enjoyment, right? Pardon? There's two kinds of enjoyment. You enjoy in the company of Krishna, right? By pleasing Krishna, like you, you, if the deities are nicely dressed every day, when you look at them, you feel, you feel joyful, you feel happy, right? And if they're not taken care of nicely, you, you know, you, you don't feel so good. And the other way is you're joyful when there's sense gratification. Just like... You ever see people when they go to a nightclub, you know, they're waiting in line, they can't wait to get in, right? Even though they have to pay money to get in. And when they get in, you know, then uh, they're, you know, uh, drinking and they're laughing and they're telling jokes and they're, uh, you know, dancing and, you know, they're going there to be happy, right? And it's all illusory, right? And they have the strobe lights and the music and... Uh, all that stuff going on, somebody's smoking marijuana, someone's shooting up uh, cocaine, you know, all to be happy. <laughs> right. So there is no problem because the soul is meant to enjoy. Yes. But we should enjoy in company of Krishna, not any kind of correct? Well, yeah. I mean, if Krishna is happy and Guru is happy, then we'll be happy. If we please Guru and Krishna, then we'll be happy. Get well enjoyed. Yeah. So, let's say you're in a, in a temple where everyone's trying to advance spiritually. So, they're waking up early, they're chanting their rounds, and they're making nice preparations for Krishna, and there's festivals going on. And there's Harinam, enthusiastic, and there's preaching, and everyone's happy. Right? But happy by making Guru and Krishna happy. Right? And in a temple where, you know, there's a lot of sense gratification, there's fighting going on, and there's politics, and uh, nobody's happy. See, so it all depends on this attachment to the objects of, this, of sense gratification. I remember how this happened in France when our temple started getting popular or started, you know, getting uh, a little opulent. So uh, at that time, uh, I had just become a grihasta. So the, the leader at that time, uh, he had a calculator. And he would always use the calculators. And how many books are you going to do today? And he makes some calculations on his calculator and says, okay, so your, your quota is so many books. Right? 
So everybody wanted to have a calculator, like the leader. And then he got a Rolex watch, so then everybody wanted a Rolex watch. Then he had his own office, so everyone wanted an office. <laughs> and then he got these really nice clothes, right? So everybody wanted the same nice clothes, you know. And then, uh, and then the, it just deteriorated after that because it was all this, you know, lavishness, you know. And then one day he said, okay, well, we're going on a new system now. Uh, everybody has uh, different departments, you know, and there's uh, leaders of each department, like the deity department, Sanctan department, the farm department, and this department, that department. He said, so uh, whenever one department requests a devotee from another apartment, department to uh, do some service, they have to be paid, right? So <laughs> they thought this was going to organize everything, right? It completely destroyed the whole mood and, you know, and people would argue, so you're not paying enough money, and it all became money-oriented, <laughs> right? And then another crazy thing, like, because there were a lot of devotees, you know, so it always became a real, uh, uh, let's say, source of anxiety for uh, the new devotee who was always asked to get the ghee lamp and take it around, see? So sometimes they would make a mistake, and it was like, you know, a real big, you know, they went to the wrong person first, you know, or the wrong, per the wrong person second, or the wrong person third, right? So... Then the leader said, okay, from now on, the Pujari just holds the, uh, the ghee lamp up like this, and everyone goes like this, right? So it became like Heil Hitler, right? When he would go like that, a hundred hands would go up like this, you know, just like Hitler. <laughs> so all these crazy things happen, you know, because, uh, you know, it, it, if the leader is crazy, then everybody else becomes crazy, you know. So you have to be very careful, very, very careful in what we do. And sh we shouldn't invent anything. Right? So one time uh, we were having a feast and I was just sitting there, you know, trying to enjoy uh, respect the feast. And then this plate was coming around, you know, one person was handing it to the other person. So the guy next to me goes like this to me. I said, what, what is it? He said, it's uh, the first pure devotee's Mahaprasadam. Take someone, pass it on. I said, okay. So I take a little bit and I pass it to the next guy. Then another plate was circulating, right? And it finally comes near me. I, I wasn't even noticing. He goes again like this. I said, what is it? He said, it's the second pure devotee's plate. Take someone, pass it around. I said, okay. So I took a little bit. Then another plate was being circulated, right? And again, he goes like this. I said, what is it? He said, it's the third pure devotee's plate. Take some and pass it around. So I take it, and then I go like this to him. He said, what is it? He said, it's my plate. You take some too. <laughs> so, you know, just crazy things, absolutely crazy things were going on. You know, they were all invented. All invented. So you have to be very careful uh, in the temple. That it should all be, you know, people should be happy since simply serving and not concerned about position and prestige and all that stuff. You know, it's just down to earth people are dedicated to helping each other advance spiritually. Then you have a happy temple. Hari Bo, all glories to Prabhupada.